Brian Village of Mondo Cat. He's here today to talk to you about catching the biggest catfish you've ever seen in your life. He's going to tell you the secret to catching those. So welcome Brian up and around the blogs and I hope you enjoy it. Well, thank you. Let's, let's hold that biggest catfish ever. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully we can catch the biggest catfish ever. Well, we're going to talk about tips for making that happen. That's what we're going to talk about today. Does everybody here like to catch big catfish? Yeah, everybody likes to catch the big ones. Big catfish, that's what we're talking about. The big blues, the big flathead, that's a lot of fun. My name is Brian Millage, and we're going to talk about tips for making it happen. If you're walking down the street, it's dark, it's night, you're kind of on the seedy part of town, you're looking over your shoulder all the time, you come to an opening and there's an alley. Look down that alley, it's dark, it's foreboding. Back of your neck starts to stand up, the fur, you're kind of nervous, and some, you hear a noise. Some guy's going, hey, hey you. You look down there, and you kind of look around, you know, you talking to me? Yeah, you. You like to catch big catfish? Yeah, I like to catch big catfish. Come here. Then you go back in there and the guy goes, you know, really? You like to catch big catfish? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I like to catch big catfish. You look at this guy, he's got his hat pulled down, kind of down by the right below his eyes. He's got sunglasses on, he's got a dark, tattered old trench coat. He opens up that trench coat and he goes, boy, if I got a deal for you. If you buy this thing here, you're gonna catch big catfish. Well, a couple things right off the bat. One, if that happens to you, don't go in the alley. Don't do it. But I'm with you, I'm with you. You know, if somebody says, you want to catch big catfish, I'm all in. So you go in the alley. Second little piece of advice, whatever that guy's selling, whatever he's got in his trench coat, don't buy it. There is no one thing out there that's gonna get you to catch a big catfish. No one technique, no one product is gonna say, I'll guarantee you're gonna catch a big catfish. I make a lot of products, sell a lot of products for the catfishing industry. If I could sell you one product and guarantee you to catch big catfish, that's what I would do. But I don't have nothing in my product line that can do that. But I said I'm gonna tell you, talk to you about how to catch big catfish. So what I'm gonna tell you is, the catfish don't care about your tackle. They really don't care. Every year we hear the same story, you know, some kid with a pink barbie pole jigging for flathead or jigging for crappie and he catches a 45 pound flathead. It, it, it happens every year. The catfish does not care about your tackle. To catch big catfish, it's a process. And let me back up this a little bit. To catch big catfish routinely and do it time and time again is a process that you perfect. It's a lot of little things added together. It's a lot of mundane, simple things done correctly. And that's what we're going to continue to talk about. I've known a lot of people in my life, a lot of people on the creek bank with a cane pole fishing and they have a five gallon bucket of catfish and they got a smile on their face and they're having the time of their life. If what you want is fun, fishing, get a coffee can full of worms to go fishing. It's fun. I've been blessed with having a passel of grandkids. This is Jade out catfish. She's got a smile on her face. She's loving it. And no matter how much fun she's having, I tell her, you're not having as much fun as I am watching you have fun. If you want to have fun fishing, it's easy to do. But if you've made the decision that you want to fish for big catfish and having fun is catching a big catfish, then we got to have a talk because there is no silver bullet going to get you there. It ain't going to happen. First thing we're going to talk about is the weather. The weather is a big part of what we're talking about. Barometer. Barometer, high and low pressure. Here west of us, clear out there, is the Rocky Mountains. The other side, clear down or southeast of us, is the ocean. Here in the Midwest, it's a big area. Very big area. Big storms move across this area. Low pressure, high pressure. Fronts that where it changes very dramatically. That low pressure system makes a difference about fishing. All of our freshwater fish, have swim bladders. That swim bladder is affected by low pressure. During that low pressure situation, that low pressure weather, those fish are gonna become very lethargic. Kind of taking, like telling your teenage kid to clean his room, they're gonna get very lethargic. 
So what do we do? Well, I'm not going to make a decision about fishing with barometer. If I have a decision to make between mowing the lawn and going fishing on a low barometer day, I'm going fishing. That's all. But we've made a decision to go after big catfish. So we've already made a decision about maybe not catching as many fish because we're targeting a specific size of fish. So now I'm thinking about it's a low pressure day. Maybe, just maybe, I'll say to myself, I won't go fishing today. I will fish the screen door in the back porch. And I'll go fishing maybe on Wednesday. It takes about three days of barometer change for fish to get acclimated to that new system. So we the front moves through, it's low pressure, and now it's higher pressure. It takes about three days for the fish to really get used to it and get back on the feed bag back on, you know, get really in a feeding frenzy. So, you know, kind of think about the barometer is a big part of what we're talking about. A way to visualize barometer is the birds. Birds are affected by low pressure, the same as fish. The birds, uh, the barometer affects their ears and their barometer, the, they have trouble in uh, low pressure system of flying to hit, screws up their equilibrium. You look up there and you see a whole high line full of little birds, you got low pressure, you got slow fish. You look up there, the birds are all, flip, all flying around looking for little bugs, you know, it's high pressure, you got active fish. You know, low pressure is a big part of this picture. Uh, a side note, catfish, the swim bladder, all fish have it, but the swim bladder of catfish is tied to their ears and they use it as a sounding board. That's how they help find their food in the water. It bounces off that swim bladder, they can feel that sound with their swim bladder. Location. We're talking about targeting big fish. We're going to maybe change about where we're going to start fishing. We might have been used to fishing out of the creek bank, catching lots of little fish. We now want to say we want to catch some bigger fish. Bigger fish live in bigger bodies of water. We're going to make a change now to go to larger rivers, larger lakes. Most of the lakes and the rivers uh, in our part of the world have been manipulated, man-made in some way. Our rivers especially have been manipulated by dikes, wing dikes, and all the structures and the core of the engineers put in some of our big rivers, the Missouri, the Mississippi, the Ohio. They have to be moving that produce up and down the river to make that happen. They've got to control the channel. Things like this, like this wing dike that you see here, move the current off to one side, put the channel in a certain place so they can keep it there, and move the barges up and down. Those structures are one of the things we're going to talk about. Here is a picture of just some different ideas. Here's a trail dike that's moving down along the, the length of the river. You have some chevrons here. These are all been put there by the Corps, and they're designed to keep that channel in a certain place. Chevrons are a pretty nasty piece of equipment that the Corps uses. Uh, chevrons are designed to deflect the power of the river, to deflect some of that erosion power that it has. And our part of the river out here, the Missouri River, it goes about seven miles an hour. That current hits the top of that chevron, it's deflected. Some of that power is now lost, and the erosion that it can cause is now lessened. So that's one of the reasons they do it. A lot of chevrons will have a break right in the middle. That's an orifice. Hydrology and hydraulics are very similar. When a fluid moves across an orifice, it loses its pressure. So what happens is that water is coming down here, it goes through that orifice. It's like holding your thumb over a garden hose. It has a lot of pressure in the hose. The water that comes past your thumb, there's no pressure. When that water goes through that orifice in the top of that chevron, it loses all that pressure, all that uh, silt that is with it is held with that pressure, now falls. So behind this chevron will be an area of very low depth, or even a sandbar. So you might have current out here, 15, 18 foot deep, right in front of the chevron, you might have 12 foot of deep. Off of the wing of this chevron, you got a little bit of scour action going, you might have that 15 foot hole again. The backside, you might have two foot of water, or even a sandbar. You have a lot of varying depth there. That's gonna draw some little fish, some feeder fish, that's what the big fish are after. The chevrons are a very good structure to fish around. It's also something you got to remember. Chevrons are a place where transoms go to die. If this water raises just 12, 18 inches, that chevron might be all the way in the water. You go along in your boat, you hit one of them, the motor comes off, falls in the water. You got to know where the chevrons are at. You got to think about that. 
All of our rivers are very well mapped. You can go to the Corps of Engineers uh, office and you can get maps of our rivers. You can get a map, and I have a book, I forgot to bring it, it'll show you where every dike and every chevron is that the Corps put in. But these are very good places to go look at some fish. Back here at this, uh, we'll, we'll talk about where some of the fish may or may not be. Fish generally, especially species of fish, will go to certain kinds of structures and certain types of water. And this is a generalization because fish swim around. And you can catch fish anywhere. You throw a bait in the water, you might catch a different kind of fish every day. But generally, most fish like a certain kind of water and will stay there. The water coming down along this uh, trail dike here will have a pretty good speed along there. When it hits the end of this dike, it will scour. If this is like 12, 15, 18 foot of water, when it gets off that scour, you might have a 20 foot hole right there, maybe even a 25 foot hole. This is the place you can even walk to the bank, get to the end. It's a good place to anchor your boat. If you're looking for that Mr. Big Blue, he's laying right out there waiting to see what comes off of that wing guy. They are big, powerful, muscular fish, and current doesn't bother them. They hang in that current all day long. And Mr. Flathead, he's a, he's a, there's a one laying right here, Flathead. Uh, they're kind of a lazy Odell, they don't like the current as much. This water will come down along here and it'll kind of break a little bit. There's a pinch point right here in this picture, you'll see it, that water coming there. Where that pinch, that water will use its power and it will scour out a hole there. It might only be five foot deep on what's around it, but that flathead will lay down in that hole and he'll just look up. He'll just be waiting for what comes by. Channel cat, uh, they'll even like to run even less than that. They might sneak up here into this area here. They'll be along this hard clay bank along in here down along this structure. Now, very honestly, you know, like I said, this is a generalization, but if you start going fishing in places like this, keep a notepad and a metal on paper of where you caught a certain fish in certain kind of location and structures, and keep going back to those, you'll keep catching the same kind of fish in those same structures. These big old blues, at night especially, they'll start trolling for food. That big old blue will leave this hole here, and he'll start going down through these chevrons. You can catch a lot of big blues at night in three, four foot of water. Big, 70, 80 pound blues. That's where they're gonna go looking for their food in that shallower water. And there again, it's kind of general, but they do follow those same structures quite a bit. My grandpa, I fished with my grandpa since I was a little kid, all the time until I didn't have my grandpa. My grandpa was a fisherman. He survived the depression, he survived World War II. He went through the 50s farming when there was you know, so much water, you didn't have very good crop almost most years. My grandpa went fishing because his family was hungry. Did he catch a lot of big fish? No. He run trample nets, the hoop nets out here in the Missouri River. He caught a lot of fish. He caught fish because his kids were at home going, feed me, feed me. That's a bunch of birds in a nest. So he wasn't worried about how big the fish were, he wanted to catch fish. And he didn't throw up nets helter-skelter, he threw them in what he called trails. And I said, Grandpa, what are you talking about water? What are your trails? He taught me that the catfish will follow trails just the same as a deer. If you're a deer hunter, you put your deer sand out of the deer trail and you wait for the buck. These rivers are trails to those fish. That's how they migrate. Morning and night, day and night, back and forth, spring and fall. They will travel up the river or stream and they will follow the structure, the side of the bank, in between places of pinch points where they have to travel because they can't go over there. Fish in the places where the fish have to go, along the banks, get the current side, the lee side, pinch points that are out there. Start learning to look for those places and when you catch fish, make that metal known where it was at and continue to go back to those places. Fish will follow those trails pretty well every single time. We have a lot of large lakes around this part of the world and it can be a little bit daunting you got a lot of water out there. Where am I going to go on this big lake to catch my big fish? All these lakes have been man-made. They've been dammed up. They've dammed up rivers, and there's a little creeks coming into those rivers. You can buy topography maps. We have the technology for our boats to you know, see that bottom. Where that old creek was, where that old river was, there's a change of elevation of that floor of the lake. That's where you need to be. That change of topography is where those fish are hanging out. They'll be either in the lower water or trying to feed as they come up the slopes of that change of topography. Never the place that you want to drift across, to bump across, 
it's a good place to anchor up and fish on top of. You know, some of the fish finders you can actually target certain fish when you see a big one or a school. But, you know, be there a place for you to continue to look for. Poles. I'm going to talk a little bit about poles and you know, on this process. I really don't care so much about the, the color of the kind, but we're starting to think about going after bigger fish. We need to start thinking about what that fish is going to do to our, to our equipment. And our equipment needs to be ready. Check your guides out. If you're using braided line, you know, are you starting to cut through a guide? Talked to a guy here a while back and he said, I caught a big fish. I, it had that pole bent over. I know I had a big one and bing, he broke off. And I looked down, I had a spot in my guide that had wore through and I just pinched off. Check your guide over. Make sure your pole is ready to go. Check your reel seat. Make sure your reel nuts that hold your reel down are ready to go. They're not loose, but your reel seat is solid. You know, guys that said they caught a big fish, they said my reel is broke off. You know, we're going to go after a big, big fish. We need a, a pole that is ready to withstand the rigors for that. The, one of the things that a lot of people say is, you know, going after a big fish, I need a big, heavy pole. And there's something to be said about that. I got no problem with that. But just because you got a big pole, that means you might catch a big fish. It just means you got a heavy pole. One of the things that I've learned as I've gotten older, that I've gotten to softer and softer poles. I like to be able to feel it. But it's kind of a personal preference. A heavy pole, a light pole, you know, that's just the action. What you need to worry about is how much backbone it has. This area here is where that pole is going to do all the work for you. When you're pulling that big fish out of current, you need to be pulling it back. You need the backbone. You're looking for a pole that's got backbone. Some of your cheaper poles are made, they're parabolic meaning that it's curled the whole way the length of the pole. That parabolic pole does not have any backbone. It doesn't have that ability to pull like you want it to. So just check your pole over and be ready for some big fish. Mono, braid. One of the things I always say, I don't really care about mono or braid. What I'm worried about is keeping it fresh. We're talking about big fish. We're talking about little things. Think about each step of the process here. So what I'm talking about on my line is, I want to keep it fresh. I want to move it every once in a while. Get a new line on it. Talked to a guy here a while back, said that I went, the barometer's right, I was in the right location. I had it, the pole was bent over, and my line broke. And I go, really? And then the conversation went on, he goes, yeah, my line was three years old. <laughs> you know, we're going after some big fish. Change your line every once in a while. Your line clear at the end with a hook and the, the, your weight is. There's a lot of activity going down, a lot of abrasion going on. Every once in a while, cut the line, go back six inches, renew it. Um, on braided, trick that I use, uh, line manufacturers don't like this, but your braided line has no memory, so it can be reused. So you're using your braided line all year long, it starts to fray, get a little braided, pull your line all the way out, take the frayed end, put it back, the line is in here still brand new. You get double the use out of it, you know, and it's still brand new. It has no memory like one. Knots. Knots seem pretty simple. You know, Grandpa taught us, Dad taught us how to tie a knot. We know how to tie a knot. The knot is the connection between you and that big fish. You've got to tie a good knot. If you make the jump to braided line, you need to start thinking about a polymer knot. You can't use the old clinch knot like you were using when you're using mono. That, pol that polymer knot will not slip like mono was on braid. Uh, when you're using mono and you're tying a knot, you know, take the time to tie a good knot, spit on it, put it in the water, make it slip. The outside of that mono has a hard, uh, very hard, brittle casing on it to protect it. When you pull a dry knot together on mono, it just kind of eat, eat, eat. If you could put that knot under a microscope, you would see that it has fractures in it. That's the weak point. That's where it's going to break on you. Get it wet, lubricated when you tie it. When you're tying the monitor knot, take the time to make sure that it lays nice. You know, the knot's all kind of jumbled up. You pull it tight. If some of the mono line is on top of one another, you can get it flattened out. That mono will push down on the other piece of mono. That's where it'll break. That's where it'll fracture. I've done this myself. I've had a good day in fishing. Things are, I'm reeling fish in. I break off. I bring that baby in, I tie a knot really fast, and I look it on my pole, and I throw it back out. Sure enough, I catch a big fish. I mean, I can tell he's big, the pole has been fighting, and I break off. I reel it in, and I looked out, and I, my knot gave free. 
I'm the guy who's supposed to have some knowledge about this, and yet I think about it, and I know what I did. I got in a hurry. I got in a hurry, and I tied a four knot. Knot is one of them small, simple, mundane things, but it's a big part of this process. Take the time, no matter how busy you are, think about it, look at the knot, tie a quality knot, and move on. If you're going on a big fishing trip, take all your poles there in the garage, retie your knots, get ready, think about what's going to happen, and that knot's got to be ready for the battle. You need a net. You know, it seems pretty simple. Yeah, I need a net. Well, we've been just pulling that old two-pound channel cat up on the bank. We're now going to go after a very big fish. You've got to have a net. You need a net big enough opening to handle it. You need a net that's got a big enough handle to handle the weight. You know, it's just one of them equipment ideas you've got to start thinking about when you make that jump to move up to getting the big fish. Bait. Bait is a, a big one. We need to talk about bait. Most fish have a preference of what they like. This part of the river, we, the Missouri River, we have a lot of cricks coming in. This big old crick chub here is a very good bait for all the fish out there. Channel cat will take a disease as anything. If you're going after trophy channel cat, you, know, you got to remember something. You, know, you can catch channel cat with a piece of uh, hot dog. But that channel cat didn't get to a trophy side by eating little pieces of hot dog. We got that by eating frogs and, and snakes and you know, other fish. You know, so you need to think about that. You know, what kind of bait you're going to be using? Those blues are big fish, and they want big food, but they're very attractive to cut bait. The oil and the, the, the blood of cut bait works very good on blues. You know, cut bait will be kind of my go-to bait going to targeting big blues. When I say cut bait, I mean fresh cut bait. I had a guy tell me, yeah, I didn't cut bait, I didn't catch a thing. Where was it, where would you get it? Well, I got it out of the freezer from last year. It was freezer burning, it was gold, you know. We're talking fresh cut bait, you know. It does make a difference. Those fish can smell the difference between bait that's been in the freezer for six months and fresh cut bait. You know, if you're, if you're catching fish and cutting the bait up, use the side when you have the red line, the lateral line going through it. That's where the oil and the blood is. That's what's going to smell the best of those fish. The big old flatheads, we've all caught flatheads on something kind of goofy like a piece of stink bait or a, a dead chub. But on the norm, Flathead, especially big flat, will eat one thing that is very lively, fresh bait that they're used to. The feel of it in their mouth, the smell of it in their nose. They want to eat something that they're used to, and don't be afraid to use big bait. And go after big fish, use big bait. Don't worry about it. On a note of bait, I like to talk about smell. Fish are very adept to smell. That's how they find their food. Fish are a swimming tongue their whiskers, their lips, their whole side of the body is that they can smell with that. The, the smells in the water are brought in receptacles. All of their body is a tongue. Just like ours, they can taste salt and pepper. They can taste what's in the water with their body. When you get a bite, what does happen is that fish is putting that bait in their mouth and they're tasting it. Is it something I'm used to? Is it something I want to eat? They're feeling it, but it's tasting with what they're using. Um, Along the lines too, before I finish that, I always want to remember this too, but we're fishing the Missouri River and some of the other places that's a little bit murky. Catfish have very good eyes. Channel cat has rods and cones just like we do. They can see the color red as clear as we can. You're fishing in clear water, you want to catch catfish, think about the color it is. You know, it does make a difference. Um, catfish also can be sensory with sound, but they use smell as the big part. So think about smell. And when I talk about it, the smell is, okay, you're out there, you're fishing. You're sitting out there in the sun, and man, it's hot. I'm getting sunburned. I'm going to put suntan lotion on. Boy, the mosquitoes are terrible. I'm going to put some mosquito repellent on. Oh, they both need a little two-cycle oil. I'm going to put two-cycle oil. Then what I'm going to do, I'm going to grab that chub and put that hook right back, that dorsal fin, and I'm going to throw it out there. You know what? I'm going to bait. I'm going to bite. Why didn't you get a bite? Well, you get a bite because the fish can smell the suntan lotion, the mosquito repellent, the two-cycle oil. They can smell whatever's on your hand when you held that bait. When you're fishing with these big fish, you gotta remember something. They excel, they got to the top of the food chain for a reason. They got there because they knew what they were doing, and they're not gonna eat something that smells like suntan lotion. It's, it's foreign to them, and it's just something they're not gonna put in their mouth. But if they do, they're gonna taste it and spit it back out. Think about your hands, think about what's going on when you handle your bait. So what I'm talking about, what I'm kind of leading up to here is this process I'm talking about. 
it is a process of a lot of little things added together. It's location, it's barometer, it's your knot, it's your line, it's you know, checking your equipment over. And any one of those points that you fail to do is the weak link. You've done all the right things. The barometer's right, the location is right, you have the right line, everything. If you tie the poor knot, you got the big fist, you just fell up to get into the boat. Any one of the things you don't do right will fail. And that's why you don't get the boat into the, the big fish into the boat. So it's a process. And you want to catch fish, you want to have fun, that's great. But if fishing is going to be fun only when you catch that big fish. You want to target that big fish. If you want to get to the preseason game all the way to playoff, you got to start thinking of each step of the line, doing it correctly and bringing it to like an excellent level. You know, that's the difference. I'd like to kind of finish with one thing is you're targeting big fish. You want to catch some big fish. Uh, there's not as many big fish there are little fish. So let's think about the next guy. If a guy catches a big fish and he wants to take it home, no problem. It's his problem. We live in America, it's a free country, more power to the guy every day. Myself, when I catch a big fish, I, I want to put him back in. Uh, I do. I love fish. I have a lot of fish fries and I cook a lot of fish and I eat a lot of fish. But I do throw a lot of my big fish back. I think it's very important to our fisheries and to the future generations. My grandkids, they want to catch that big fish. But if we're going to do catch for release, it's still part of this process. Think about it. If we're going to catch a big fish and we're going to plan on it, we're going to be successful and we get that big fish in the water, be ready. Have a set of gloves ready. Get the gloves wet. Don't handle the fish with dry clothes and gloves. You know, we've all seen the guys, you know, get done. Oh, look at all that slime. I got that slime. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Well, that slime is what the fish uses to protect itself. Now, that fish is back in the water with no slime. That's how he gets sores. That's how he gets infections. And that's how he could die. We've all seen the picture of the guys holding the big fish. They're holding it up like this. The great picture it is. Every time that fish flips his tail around, his guts get further and further ran down to the bottom of his body. You put the fish back in the water and see him lively. Three days later, he dies because his guts are still twisted up at the bottom. You know, we can do catch and release. Get ready for it. Have a plan. I have my phone ready. I have a picture to take with it. Get that fish back in the water as quickly as you can. You know, the sooner he can get back in the water, the better chance he has for survival. So catch and release is big, but also think about it and be ready to do that. So as we kind of end here a little bit, you know. There's a lot of steps here, and what I'm trying to get at is each one of those steps is important, and each one is a place for failure. Barometer is a big part of it. Low pressure system, fish are very lethargic. You want to have location, you want to fish where big fish are at. You can't fish, you know, where the fish don't want to be, or there's no food there, or no structure for them. You know, it takes a little bit of time to take notes, keep thinking about where you're catching these fish, and go back to those places. Check your pole door for damage. Make sure your equipment is ready for the riggers that you set out to put them in. Uh, with line, keep it fresh. Cut it back every once in a while. Not a good knot, quality knot. Uh, I did forget about a couple things, and one of them is uh, hooks. Uh, I don't care what kind of hooks you got, I really don't. I have one thing to say about hooks, sharp hooks. Sharp hooks will make a difference. You're fishing out there, you're having a great day, you get snagged. You pull and you pull and you pull and you can't quite get it out. And you got a bite over here and you finally get it pulled out. Ah, and here comes a big old piece of bark. You were stuck on a tree. You know, you look down, you just throw another piece of bait on, you throw it back out. That hook's not near as sharp as it once was. It was on that tree. You were snagged in a rock. You know, you tweaked it a little bit. You know, at that point, you think to yourself, well, I really want to use it. Change that hook, get a new hook. Use a bigger hook than you've probably been used to. We got you some big fish, we want a shank that won't break off. Big fish won't break the shank, they will. So use a good hook, quality hook, and keep them sharp. Use a glass bead on your hook or on your, your knot. This glass bead here is here, it'll protect your knot, your weight pounding all the time. Use a glass bead to protect that knot. You tied a good knot, protect it with a glass bead. Uh, I didn't talk about reels. Uh, there again, I happen to be using a bait caster here. There's a lot of big fish that caught with spinners. I uh, really don't care if it's a spin or cast. I will say this, if you fish long enough for big fish, uh, you will kind of gravitate toward a bait caster. They have the frame and the power and the gear ratio to handle the riggers of big fish. But a spinning is no problem. If you like it, use them. The one thing I'm going to say about uh, reels, loosen your drag. 
I don't care where your drag's at now, loosen it. More big fish have been lost by a tight drag than ever been with, with a loose drag. You get a big old fish, you get him there, you get close to the bank, you're about ready to get him in the water. He makes that last run. The drag's set too tight, ping, he's gone. You know, if your drag is too loose and he gets to the boat and makes that last run, what he's gonna do is come out there about five feet, 10 feet, and you're gonna reel him back, you know. Keep your drag loose. When I'm on a big fish myself, my drag starts out very loose, and then bringing him in, I'm using my thumb, I'm using the load of the pole to control him, and if I have to, then I set my drag a little tighter. He gets closer, I loosen it back up. When a big fish, my drag is going loose and tight the whole time I'm bringing it in. Use your drag, keep it loose. Good quality net. Uh, cut bait, good uh, oily, bloody bait for the, uh, the blue, fresh on big flats, live bait. Big chub, big bluegill. Smells, keep your hands clean. And if it all works, use uh, the idea of CPR, put those big fish back. So it's a process. It's a lot of little things, a lot of mundane things, but it's simply done at a different level. So catch those big fish. You just gotta start thinking about some of these things. And uh, that's all I got. I really like to appreciate the chance here to talk to you. Thank you. My name is Brian Millich from Undercat. Fish big or go home. If you've got any questions, I'm more than happy to talk to anybody.